Raising the Bets is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to Raising the Bets, where a Catholic couple raising five kids outside of Boston Join us as we share the joys and challenges of marriage, homeschool, and our adventures near and far as we make sense of the world and experience the best parts of our culture. I'm Don Bettinelli. And I'm Melanie Bettinelli. Sure in Bagora, Melanie. No. <laughs> it's St. Patrick's Day. Well, it was St. Patrick's Day on Friday. And uh, so funny thing, last night, you this it's Sunday, so last night Saturday night, you played this video from that you found on Facebook of uh, from the Muppet Show, of uh, Beaker Animal and the Swedish Chef. I almost called him Swiss, so that would have been wrong. Swedish Chef singing Danny Boy together, which yeah. is a, it's funny. And then we go to mass this morning. We're sitting down, and before mass, the 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 organist starts playing Danny Boy, and. The pianist. The pianist. Organist pianist. Yes. She doesn't play the organ. She starts playing Danny Boy. And it's like, well, you tell me what your what your reaction was. My reaction was, why is she <laughs> playing Danny Boy? That's not a him. I mean, I know why, because it's St. Patrick's Day, but it's not a him. <laughs> And there are, I mean, there are many but it's before mass. So right. it's not it's not egregious it's not during mass. But but there are many um, sometimes she she often plays hymns before mass. Yes. And. There are many Irish, beautiful Irish hymns that you, one, could, one play. could play. Maybe not off the top of her head that she's familiar with, but yeah. OK, but so you kind of look at me. I was sitting in the pew behind because I we was, didn't all fit in the pew. Yeah. You turned to look at me like with this look on your face. Like, like why is she playing Danny Boy? So I thought you were looking at me because you thought. Because you were remembering, like I was, <laughs> the Muppet Show version of it, and I'm starting to like, be, like picture animal, <laughs> Danny boy, Danny, Danny, and, oh, and Beaker, boy, oh, boy. meep 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 meep, <laughs> and I start mouthing it to Isabella and Sophie, and they're like, "Why are you doing that?" Not remembering myself that you didn't, they didn't see the videos. <laughs> Like, there is a Bella and her Sophie watched the video. You're like, why is dad cracking up and <laughs> doing this weird version of quiet Danny boy behind us? Oh my gosh. But Anthony was remembering and he was cracking up. And then Ben me. started cracking up. <laughs> and then when Anthony and Ben started cracking up, uh, I got a clue and I realized why they were cracking up. And then I realized that you were cracking up and I was like, Oh my goodness, what have I started? <laughs> oh my gosh. The, the, I mean, the Danny boy was, it was funny enough, just like the Danny boy at random, but <clears throat> the Muppet Danny boy. The Muppet Danny boy is, by the way, if you, if you haven't seen it, it is, it is worth looking up. I'll, it is hilarious. I'll put a link in the show notes. Cause yeah, you, you definitely have to watch it. <laughs> Why does the Muppet Show ever go off the air? It is the that is the funniest show. I know variety shows kind of went, you know, yeah. out. But gosh, the Muppet Show was the best. I I think that was that that was part of it. N nobody knew what variety shows were anymore because like the only variety show I ever remember watching was the Muppet Show. Yeah, Carol Burnett, the, the Donnie and Marie, all those variety shows. They, they were long gone. Yeah, I know they were. They were when I was a kid. I mean, the, the closest we get now is like SNL and like late night talk shows. I mean, late night shows are kind of variety shows. They, they, That's what I mean. They, they, they have performers come on. And they, they always a have song. a musical guest yeah. and then they have celebrities, but they don't do skits. No, like no. SNL still does skits. It's like it's like the variety show is broken off into the show that does skits with a musical guest and the show that does um, special guests with a musical guest sort of thing. What? <laughs> no, like 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 late night talk shows late right. night shows is like celebrity guests and a musical guest and right. snl is like they also have musical guests also has a musical guest and they have the skits with a celebrity guest yeah but they don't but they don't they don't talk to them they don't but, have but they don't have but they don't have that variety like the the full variety of the variety show sure they do they have skits 
like it's no different from the Muppet Show. The Muppet Show didn't have other things other than skits. Oh yeah, usually. Well, the Muppet Show also had like the backstage, the funny backstage. The, right, the backstage stuff that knit this the the frame narrative that knit it together. Right. Yes. Um, <clears throat> plus, like the the interviews with the like talking they didn't to. Do... Yeah, they did. Like, well, I guess they sometimes had you know Fozzie talking to a comedian or something. I guess. But Kermit would talk to him like they would they would have little little brief <laughs> interludes interludes sure. of talking to them. Sure. It wasn't like so what, your new movie coming out. Uh, tell me about it. Well, no, not quite like that. <laughs> no, Johnny Carson. No, Adrian, that would be no. That would actually be a funny a funny bit. Like have uh, Kermit sitting behind the desk and the star come in sitting there. That would have been good. Anyway, what are we talking about? Oh. So St. Patrick's Day, <laughs> we had St. Patrick's Day. We had our corned beef, and I had my traditional day after St. Patrick's Day breakfast of corned beef hash and eggs, which is my favorite breakfast. And um, then, and, and yes, we, we do know that corned beef is not actually Irish. It's American Irish, but we don't care because we like corned beef. And this is the time of year when the grocery store sells corned beef, and they don't sell it in the store. They don't sell it at any other time, so we, we buy it and we yeah. eat it. Yes. If you listen to the American Catholic History episode on St. Patrick's Day, you'll find out what, where corned beef came from. Right. The, the poor Irish mothers would go down to the docks and buy left, the leftover salted beef from ships that had returned to port and had left beef left over, and they would sell it at a, yes. you know, at a discount. It was, so it was cheap. So, uh, and then today, well, today would have been St. Joseph's Day, but the church, because it's Sunday, has moved it to the celebration to Monday. But Nevertheless, but we because we Monday is a school day and I don't have time to do extra cooking for St. Joseph's <laughs> Day on Monday, went ahead and moved it right back to today. Yes. So we had the the uh, today. Uh, today is Benedict's uh, Saint Day because his middle name is Joseph. Right. So we had um, cream puffs. Cream puffs. Yes. It was nice. Very yummy. So um, let's speaking of food, let's talk about some food we've been eating. Uh, I made last week, I made a dish I've made before. Um, it's ten, his name is Lomo Saltado, which is basically a Peruvian steak stir fry. Uh, so it's a dish that comes from Peru and it's really good um, and really easy to make. So the way it, you make it, it's just got sirloin tips. So um, any type of sirloin that you want to cut up. I got on sale. There was, it was nice. They had some sirloin steak tips on sale. Uh, with some cumin, black pepper, soy sauce, uh, red onion, red wine vinegar, garlic, jalapenos, and a bunch of grape tomatoes. Or, or I use cherry tomatoes because our store didn't have grape tomatoes. So it's no big deal. I, I don't, honestly. Grape tomatoes are smaller. So that's yeah. all. Yeah. So um, you, you marinate the steak. You know, it's chopped up into little um, half-inch strips. Uh, you marinate the steak with the cumin, salt and pepper and, and some of the soy sauce for just 10 minutes. That's it. Just 10 minutes in a bowl. And then you cook it in the in a skillet um, in a couple of batches because you can't get it all in a skillet at once. It'll be overcrowded. Just a few minutes each side. And then once that's done, you put the onion in to cook it just so it starts to wilt. Then you add the, the vinegar, the rest of the soy sauce. And then cook it for a little bit till it thickens, and then because from the soy sauce, and then uh, and actually the vinegar would help it thicken too. And then add garlic, jalapeno, cook, 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 thirty seconds at most, just till the garlic is fragrant. And then you add the tomatoes. The tunas don't cook very long at all. You add the tomatoes, put the meat back in, th just enough to warm the meat back up again. Thirty seconds, boom, you're done. I mean, it is literally like, you know, besides the prep, maybe a half hour of cooking. It was a pretty quick meal. Yeah. And it's really good. I mean, everybody likes the taste. Some of the kids, they they don't love the chewiness of the steak. They felt it was too chewy, which, you know, sirloin tips are kind of one of those where they, they kind of come, they pull apart easily. So it's not, you don't need a knife to eat it. Um, But I don't know. They, they're really t sensitive to you having to chew beef. Or whatever, but uh, I like it, and I would. I would. I serve it with. Did I serve it with rice. Rice. Yeah. Although Ben got a tortilla and put his in a tortilla. It works really well on a tortilla. That's for sure. Yeah, I liked it. Um. So that was good. And then the other dish uh, we made this week uh, was today, 
Yeah, chicken marbella. Now, I've never made this before, but it's kind of a well-known dish, apparently. There was a recipe, there was a, recipe, there was a cookbook years ago called the Silver Palette Cookbook, which was a real, really well-known cookbook. I want to say it was like from the, I should look it up. I don't want to say the wrong thing. It's in, be silly. Um, but I want to say it's like from the 80s. Uh, let me see. Silver, Sheila Lukens, Julie Rossi, Rosso, and yeah, 1982 it came out. So this goes way back. It's a, it's a classic American cookbook. And it had this dish in it that it was really well known for called Chicken Marbella. I had been meaning to make this other dish, Pork mar Marbella. It was a pork version, but I can't get the smoked, um, not smoked, the Boston butt, which is a, a cut of beef. Uh, or pork butt is the other name for it. The, our, any kind of pork? Yeah, our our supermarket doesn't stock it, or maybe it only stocks it in the summer or something. But so, but this version just uses chicken thighs, which is nice and easy. And it's a slow cooker recipe too, so that's that's also nice and easy. And what's interesting about it is it's the besides the chicken, the main ingredients are olives, prunes, and capers. Those are your big flavor. Uh, punches in this and so what you do is is you you take the thighs so they're bone in skin on thighs first you put them in a skillet skin down and you sort of you're, you're browning the skin and rendering off a bunch of fat that's the that's the big thing you do in there so it doesn't all end up in the slow cooker once you've done that you put it in the slow cooker and then you take um the green olives pitted green olives of course because you don't want to put pits in the food processor that would be bad um prunes pitted prunes capers brown sugar garlic oregano red pepper flakes salt and pepper in the food processor until it's finely chopped then you you, you reserve a little bit of that for later when the when it's done cooking but you put the rest of it on top of the chicken in the in the slow cooker then you add um also a cup of chicken broth and some white wine and a, a another bunch of the prunes just cut in half so they're bigger so they're more substantial so they don't dissolve in the in the slow cooking that's the big thing and then you cook it for four hours on low uh, it said four to six hours but at four hours it was done like i could have started it later because it was done early and then um when it's done you take the chicken out put it on a serving platter and then you stir in some, like just a tablespoon of orange juice, uh, the the reserved olive mixture, um, another tablespoon of capers, and salt and pepper. And you're supposed to pour that over the chicken. I served it on the side in a gravy boat because it, it, I like to. The chicken was literally falling off the bone. It was super tender. Super falling off the bone. Now you don't like slow cooker chicken. I, I just don't really love the texture. Uh. Yeah, it is OK. I liked the flavors a lot. I wanted more prunes. Yeah. And I wanted it to be thicker, like the sauce was really thin. I wanted it to be a sauce that kind of drapes. Yeah, uh, le less of a. It's a jus, really. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted more sauciness, maybe a little bit of flour added to it or just more of the. Olives and capers and prunes to like make it a thicker. Right, you could have a ragu sort of texture. maybe could have taken the immersion blender to it. So what I might but have I also done, liked the big chunks of prunes. Like I wanted more I chunks. Know, I was gonna say like so. This at the end, you add in the the reserved olive mixture. So before you add that in and the rest of the capers, maybe do the um, immersion blender and then add in more of that. Maybe it's just it wanted more thickness, more stuff. Right. So, uh, but the flavor itself, I liked it. It was really good. And the kids all liked it. Yeah. I mean, maybe a little bit more of the juice, orange juice, like a little sweeter. Could have been. I mean, to balance out the, like the olives and the capers. Um, but it was, it was good. I would just want to tweak it a little bit. Right. Right. Um, I'm, I'm curious about it with pork. And I wonder if the pork would hold up to the slow cooker a little bit better. Well, the interesting is this is this the pork one doesn't use the slow cooker. It's just in the Dutch oven in the oven, but it's a braise. It's still a braise. Right. So it's essentially kind of like the slow cooker. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I would like maybe double the orange juice to like two tablespoons. Right. And then double the prunes. Yeah, I would do like um, two thirds of a cup of the pitted prunes at the end. And then uh, I'm trying to try to think two thirds a cup there. And then maybe three quarter cup up front with the olives in the uh, food processor. I think maybe that would be better. Yeah. So I would make this again, though. It was pretty easy. You know, I, I like slow cooker recipes. You don't. You don't like cooking with a slow cooker. Yeah. And you know, I, I, I just I'm not a huge fan of that texture with the meat. Right. Like even with a pulled pork, if I make it like in the instant pot, I like it when I put it in the oven and it gets like kind of crisp and it like that changes the texture from just being the soft meat to having a little bit of a more texture to it. Mm. I it's it's a texture thing, really. Interesting. Yeah, I mean Sophie said it would felt kind of dry and it it's interesting because it's fall apart, but it was kind of dry. But I think that might have been because it sat in the slow cooker on warm for quite a long time after it was done while I, while we were waiting for the rest of right. the dinner. So it's hard to, it's hard it to know what early. the texture would have been like if we had eaten it right away. Right away. Yeah. That might've been better. That, so that's another variable that we yep. can't really count for. Yeah. So yeah. But I mean, that's not to say it wasn't a good recipe. It was, I, I, I like it and I'd like to try it again, just, you know, tweak it here and there and, and maybe try the uh, pork one uh, next time. That that would be, if I can get a, I had to get to the go to the butcher and get up the the Boston butt. That would be, that's the trick. The the butcher keeps having these sales on these days. I can't get over there. And it was driving me crazy. I want to get over there, get to the sale. So that's what we've been cooking. I also made some biscuits, by the way, some buttermilk biscuits. I'm getting better at those biscuits. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my cream puffs didn't puff. Yes, you mentioned yeah. So the cream puffs, you were trying a a different recipe. No. It's the same one? Same one. Oh, I thought it was the new one that was in the recipe app. Um, but you felt, you, you thought that, um, what happened to the puffs? What made them not puff? So so just following the, the instructions, it basically, you know, describes like the, the dough for the pot au choux. That's the pastry. Um, it was supposed to be shiny and it was supposed to kind of drip off the, slowly, dr- slowly drip off the beater. And right. it kind of looks too thick. So it said, if it's too thick, you can add another egg. And I did that. But then I think that that made it too thin. Another like, egg was too much. Another egg was too much. It needed like half an egg, maybe more. <laughs> um, so I think that the wetness kept it from puffing as much as it should have. I mean, mm. the, they were still okay. C- cut them open and put the cream inside. The p- pastry came, cream came out. The texture was perfect, which last year... The texture on the pastry cream totally failed. It didn't get thick enough. Oh, so, right. Yeah, it was like a. It was drippy. Yeah. Yeah. This was. Yeah. Those. They were good. Um. Everybody had a couple and um. <laughs> went back. For, kept going back for more. So. Yeah. So that's what we've been cooking. So and I made a decision. I've got all these cookbooks on our on our bookshelf that's in our kitchen that I never look at, and I really need to start digging into those and making it concerted effort to start cooking out of the cookbooks i have all these app you know these recipes in the app paprika that's what, that i use on the computer and the phone but i never look in the cookbook so i really want to get back to using those cookbooks to find recipes to, to make because we get all these i just i've stopped buying cookbooks because i just felt guilty like i'd get this cookbook and i never do anything with it just, right yeah so now i'm going to do I am going to do it. But we still don't need more cookbooks. But not until we cook through all of these. <laughs> so let's talk about things we've been reading and watching. Uh, let's start with things I've been watching um, or we've been watching because we watched the season finale of the first season of Last, The Last of Us. Uh, this was the uh, the HBO show starring Pedro Pascal and Bella Ramsey. I don't know why I can't remember her name. Like Bella, you'd think I'd remember that. Yeah. And uh, about it's a post-apocalyptic and about this mutant fungus that uh, takes over people's minds and that sort of thing. It's not really zombies, but it's zombies. Yes. So um, last episode. Interesting. So I I don't want to spoil too much, but I'm going to maybe spoil just a teeny bit uh, because I want to talk about it. And you got to spoil a little bit to talk about it. So, you know, give me five minutes if you haven't watched the whole season yet and you plan to. Which is in the second to last episode, the penultimate episode, 
the uh, character Ellie, the girl, she basically has to save herself from peril because we, we talked about that last time. I know. I know. Okay. Because Joel can't for reasons. Right. But in the last one, he does save her. Like, I remember I was commenting last time, like they had her, she had to save herself. She, you right. Know, in this one, there was no way she could save herself. He needed to save her. Yeah. He needed to be the one who saved her. Right. Um, and in doing so, he has to do things that she would not agree with and not tell her. Right. So he ends up not telling her the truth about what happened. Yes. For her own good. Yeah. I felt like there was a lot of moral complexity and ambiguity in this final episode, especially throughout the whole show. Yeah. But in this last episode, especially I was left feeling like I couldn't entirely disagree with any of the actions that he took. I think that there were justifications or reasons for them, Mm -hmm. even though I think that he was morally in the wrong. At the same time, living in the particular environment, they are under this specific situation they're in. I understand completely why he does what he does. I think it's false under self-defense, defense defense of the innocent. I, I... you could argue that some of the people he ends up taking out could perhaps have been incapacitated, but that they might have, but they would almost certainly have followed after them and he would have right. had to take care of them later. I mean, there's it's, this is it's at least ambiguous, right? There's a certain sense in which like when you are outnumbered and you're trying to protect an innocent person and you have no backup to what extent is like deadly force. Do you just wipe them Justifi- all out? Justified. Yeah. Um, especially like taking out people who are already down. Right. Or k- killing, killing people who are wounded and. Or unarmed. I mean, there's at least, well, yeah. there's one person who's sort of armed, but yeah. Right. So, so he, but you could say like, it's just the two of them. They're far away from anybody who would help them. Right. And these people would definitely hunt them down. So I suppose you could say that that killing them means that they are permanently not able to be right. a threat. But, th- but there is a definitely that's, that's he writing there's an ambiguity. A, there's writing a, a yeah. definite line there. So I looked up the, the plot of the video game uh-huh. and this season was pretty much exactly that from front to end. That's how the, this is how the game ended. Uh, although interestingly, Joel and what's her name? The smug, the uh, Tess were, they were gun runners. They were weapons smugglers, specifically. Uh-huh. The, in, the, in the show, it's ambiguous as to what they've been doing. Right. Well, remember, in the first two episodes, they were looking for a car battery. Right. In the game, they were looking for a weapons cache that had, been, that had not been delivered to them by that guy who eventually... So, so a car battery is definitely more neutral. It's like we're yeah. just a device by which we can go on to the next step. Right. And that guy was in the game, wasn't his brother. It was just a firefly that he knew. But, but there's a whole level of like, you see this journey that Joel goes on through this, where he starts out as this dad loves his daughter. um, And then apocalypse happens and he has this break with all of the things that he cares about. He, and he talks about having done things, evil things to survive in the past 20 years. And when we catch up to him again, 20 years later, he's this hardened man, uh, does no heart, uh, or, or apparently. And by the end of it, like that last episode, after what had happened in this, in the penultimate episode, he was different toward her. She was damaged clearly, but he was also very different toward her. Yeah. I felt like there was a little bit of a, jump with his character he well clearly time had passed right but 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 yeah time has passed and and yet i i do think that there is a there's kind of a shift like suddenly he's solicitous fought more fatherly much more paternal yeah much warmer much more connected there could have been a whole mo- another episode they could have added in there that they, they didn't right uh, i mean in terms of storytelling 
I bought it. Like I, I wasn't skeptical about the change that he underwent because he'd no. already been moving in that direction anyway, even yes. before that. But especially in the final episode, in the very final scene, he's almost going too far. Like for her, like he's kind of oversharing about his past. Right. And she's kind of clearly uncomfortable about the degree to which he's telling her about his past. Well, because now she's no longer where she was. She's now got reason to hold back because of what had happened to her. So, so they both kind of moved in opposite directions. Which is, which is an interesting character in terms of character arc. It's interesting that they've kind of gone back and forth in terms of their desire for connection with each other. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I looked at the plot of the just briefly looked at the plot of the second game, uh -huh. assuming that's where the maybe the next season will come, because it felt like this was a complete story. Like it doesn't really need to be another season. Right. Um, but they are planning it. And that one takes uh, picks up five years later. So I'm curious, I if they're going to go with the same actors, they're not going to do five years later, they'll do something less than that. But I also well, feel like this had to have been at least a whole, a year's worth of journey. Right. But yeah, I don't know if they, if they plan to pick up with the same characters, but. Or pick up it. I mean, depends on how quickly they come out with the next season. Too. <laughs> right. These days with streaming, who knows how long it will be before the next season of anything comes out. It could be another five years. Yes. That, well, that goes along with another thing I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, so The Last of Us, uh, surprisingly good. I was not expecting it to be as good as it was. Um, yeah, it's good. I still not necessarily wanting more like story continuing, although I think I would definitely watch a second season. But I feel like there's still questions. I, I still feel like I want something more from the characters, something more I mean, it feels like they were both a complete journey and yet there's still open-ended threads. There's still questions. There's still an unresolved situation regarding her and right. her unique place in the world. Um, there's, you know, and then, yeah, I mean, if, if this were a regular TV series, like a network TV series, they'd go back to the village, to the town, and then they would, start their life and they would be, you know, she'd find a boy and then he would, you know, maybe find a woman and there'd be the, they'd create these tensions and there'd be ongoing encounters with whether it's the infected or Raiders or so they would, they would draw it out and it wouldn't be, a, they could have an episodic show in, in other words. I, yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's hard when you've got a story, a story that is a journey story like this. It's a quest narrative, yes. right? quintessential quest they're trying to get from point a to point b on a long journey and they've got a definite end goal and a um a lot of quests are quests for retrieval or lord of the rings is a quest to destroy but this isn't quite so much that but it is definitely a quest to accomplish a mission accomplish right. a task and they sort of did, but they sort of didn't. I mean, there's a, there's a certain it's open lack, lack yeah. of resolution there, which I think maybe that's sort of the feeling of they finished the journey, but they didn't accomplish all of the tasks of the mission. And therefore, there's, there's a sense in which, well, wh where does that leave us now? Where does this leave the world? You know, right. By the way, did I call it or did I call it? I called exactly what was going to the, the final obstacle that they were going to encounter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know how they, these things work. So uh, I just want to talk about another show. I finished watching on Netflix called Kaleidoscope. This was a one season, six or eight episodes. And it was a unique show in that it's, it's a heist story. So a vault being broken into by a crew, but the way it was told it was interesting. Each episode took place at a different period in time. One, you know, it starts as far back as 24 years before the heist and then ends up six months after the heist. And, and it's sort of a revenge story and a heist story. And 
one of the unique things about it is which is because it's streaming every person who watches it gets give you Netflix delivers the episodes in a different order. The episodes are color coded, the yellow episode, the green episode, the red episode, the purple episode. And, and so you get the story out of order of it. You don't go from 24 years ago to three years ago to six months ago. You get, you know, whatever. So this is like the extreme of nonlinear storytelling where there's not, there's not, they're not, ordered at all like it's, right and in fact the story has to work from any beginning point that, that seems like an interesting challenge as a for, for a writer yeah um it worked in fact the the heist episode there were there were so the, there's the heist itself and then there is the day after the heist is another episode and six months after the heist is another episode and those two I it showed me those two before it showed me the heist, mm -hmm. and of course things go wrong in the heist. So of course they always do, um, and you don't get to see what went wrong until you you've already watched the aftermath, which was very interesting. Right, right. I mean, I love nonlinear storytelling, and I love the sort of idea of seeing the aftermath before in the something went wrong before you get the what went wrong. I mean, wasn't there a Tarantino movie that did that? Reservoir Dogs didn't that do that? Yeah, right. Yeah, like we see the after the, the we see the aftermath of the job before we know what happened at the job. Right. Yeah. Um, and then we also like uh, the movie. Now I'm blanking on the name. Any of the actors? I am the worst at remembering actor names. <laughs> Any part of the, part of the plot? Uh, it, was it the one, the Memento? The, no, not Memento. Although uh, that was a good one too. Yeah, that one's going backwards. Right. Um. the The tagline was the the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing people that he doesn't exist. Oh, um, but I can't look that up because that's actually a saying. I know, I know, it's a saying. Um, so I and I don't recognize that movie. Shoot, I. Anyway, um, movie quote: "The trickiest trick the devil ever pulled." Uh, bottle air, yeah. Usual suspects. Usual suspects. Yes. Yeah. That was a great. That another movie where you kind of. And you, you begin with Kevin Spacey sort of being interrogated and then you kind of go back and you've. Oh. I saw the first 10 minutes of that. That's it. I don't know what happened. It was after we were married. I was like, watched the first 10 minutes and I never got beyond it for some reason. Oh, that's such a great movie. <laughs> uh, anyway. You probably had I, a baby or something. Probably. Yeah. I, I do like movies that are told in non-linear non-linear fragmentary yeah. ways that's my favorite storytelling device i don't know why and this one is rufus sewell as one of the characters i don't know who that is oh, oh you know him he's the crown not not the crown victoria was he albert yes oh, okay and he, he was all uh i mean if i look up rufus sewell and then uh moff gideon um so that's rufus sewell on the screen there um, I, I am like the worst with faces. Yeah, yeah I know. Sorry. You are face blind. Um, and then Moff Gideon, um, Giancarlo Esposito was the main character. Oh, okay. He was really good. Uh, I mean, that sounds like, really a, good. sounds like a show I would like because I like that kind of storytelling. Yeah. Um, so I want to run through a couple more pretty quick because it's going okay. on. So. Because uh, you've been busy. Season two premiere of Shadow and Bone, which is another Netflix show, which is based on a, ser a series of books. It's like a, a couple of books and then some ancillary short stories, collections, and that sort of thing, I guess. Um, it takes place in this world that's sort of like ours. It's got an you know analog to, say, like a Russian and Asian and maybe English countries surrounding the sea. There's magic, these, these um, magic uses called Grishka that they each have a particular kind of ability. Their abilities are all uh, focused on what there's one called a heart render who can actually manipulate hearts like they cause people's hearts to stop for or, you know, or other things like that. Or uh, apparently it also can affect emotion too. or somehow. I'm not sure how that works. Um, 
so there like are people who meanings, can be, both meanings of the word heart. Yes. There is so there basically there's and there's healers and stuff like that. So there's people who can manipulate living people, people the Grishka who can manipulate um things like metals or growing things or like not growing things, that would be the other one. Wood, I don't know, like imitate like inanimate rock, objects. Rock, yes. plastic. Um and then uh, there was another one too, I forget what it was. So um but the story is this thousand, you know, hundreds of years ago this this dark magic user created something called the fold. And it's this scar through the land of Ravka that when you enter it, it's sort of like the, um, well, for people who've seen stranger things, it's sort of like the upside down. It's this dead area of darkness and these awful creatures live in it that will kill you if you go in there. Um, and it's, it's broken this country in two. It's like if, if the, if the Rockies were, had this thing on them and you couldn't get past. So, you know, they, they try to, they have to pass and, it's so whatever. Um, there's war. And then, so you have the, him, the bad guy, the Darkling, and then you have the legend of the Sun Summoner who will come and shed light and is the opposite of the Darkling. And so you have this orphan girl who, you know, surprise, turns out to be the Sun Summoner that, that comes up early in the first season. Um, so it's pretty good. It's a It's a world that's got a lot of elements to it. But it feels like it's like a lot of these shows where you have all of these young, beautiful people like no one, no one important in the story is over the age of 35. Most of them are under the age of 30 and they're all, you know, impossibly good looking and earnest. And, you know, it's just like it, it's a it's a bunch of young people. It's like a, it's like a oh, what's the it's like a WB show or, you know, the, the uh, you know, the the the, the network that. um the green arrow and Supergirl is on, you know, that sort of stuff. It just feels like a lot of those shows in that sense. Still, it's kind of, kind of interesting. It's really good world building. So I, I enjoyed for that. I think was, weren't those originally young a YA novels. They are all this stuff is always got YA novels. Right. So, yeah. I mean, I suppose it would make sense if it's YA, then there's going to be like hunger games, like, like, um, Oh, all of these post-apocalyptic ones or Harry Potter. Yeah, they're all YA novels. So all the all the people in it are impossibly young and good looking. You know, that sort of thing. I mean, at least Harry Potter had the like Dumbledore and McGonagall and Snape who are older. Yes, it did. It did. Uh, but they didn't do much. <laughs> so saw that pretty good. First, you know, second season. Uh, you know, I I was looking forward to the second season, the first from the first season. I like the world building that they did. Ted Lasso season three season premiere first episode. I felt like the second season of Ted Lasso lost a little bit of the magic from the first season. I don't know. There was something missing in the earnest goodness of it. Uh, that would, is what made uh, season one so good. Maybe that's just the, the sort of thing that you can't keep up uh, with ever. But the season premiere of season three, which is the last season, I felt like it had it back. There was Ted went through a crisis, a personal crisis in season two that I think took away a little bit from it. And the focus really turned toward um, the other character, Roy Kent, in that one, which Roy is a great character. He's just hysterical. He is the curmudgeon of all curmudgeons. He's like the opposite of Ted. Um, but he, he's deep down. He's a really good guy. But he's like gruffness six inches deep, like like all all around. It's so it's really it's really great character. But anyway, um. I like it. I'm, I'm hopeful for this season and uh, I'm sad that it's ending after three seasons. And then finally, there's another show on Amazon prime called carnival row. Right. First season was in 2019. The second season and final apparently came out this year, four years later. Um, it's so it takes place in a sort of analog to Victorian England. Although in this world there's apparently only two countries, the Berg and the Pact, and then this land, which is sort of Ireland, you know, with fairies that live in it. So you have uh, various, all kinds of fairy, um, you know, sat satyrs and winged fairy, you know, picks and um, that sort of stuff. And there's lots of analogs to um, slavery or racism or what the British did to the Irish in it. And, uh, but this season, it introduces this element of communism and this communist revolution kind of overthrowing. Which is really typical for a Victorian period because you had a lot of like socialism mm -hmm. 
And so this at that point, there's an analog to this communist uprising and revolution. And what's interesting is, is how they try to let it talk for itself. You know, the, the, the rhetoric, but it's clear to the viewer that it's bad. You know, it's like animal farm where, you know, everyone's equal, but some are more equal than others. And, um, the, you know, there's a, there's a strong undercurrent of this is a very bad system. We sh- we cannot let this spread, which is kind of surprising in today's day and age where I feel like a lot of young people don't have the same visceral um, distrust and dislike of communism that say our generation had growing up in the cold war. Um, so it's kind of interesting as far as like the, the story itself and the way it ended um, it was unsatisfying. I felt like they kind of ended abruptly and the, I just, I felt like I don't want to give too much away, but I felt like where they left a lot of the characters was um, unrealistic, a little bit forced, unsatisfying. Like why did those two characters end up together? Like they work with completely different people not that long ago. And if there was, it felt like it's forcing an agenda. Uh, a lot of entertainment now w- uh, wants to force the same sex agenda on things. And so you had these characters who were with opposite sex people and end up in, the, in a same sex relationship at the end. And you're like, the, why? <laughs> um, and of course, with this stuff, yeah, never mind. I don't want to get into it, but uh, it was it it was a little unsatisfying at the end. I, I felt like they they rushed it and forced it, and it just didn't. And maybe it was because it had been so long from the first season that they just they just needed to end it. All right, so that's whew, everything I've been watching. There's still more to come. There's more like we're, we're, like the new season of Grace dropped today. That's the uh, ITV series, right. British series uh, that you and I going to watch. Um, I mean, it, it seems like it feels like season premiere, like when we were kids. It's like September and October. Except it's March. Except it's March. March get, Madness. Like we didn't even talk about the book uh, about uh, Mandalorian. No, we didn't. So um, is there anything we want to say about this week's Mandalorian? The Convert? I liked the episode. Um, I know in the chatter on the Secrets of Star Wars Facebook page, there were a lot of people who thought who I mean, it was an interesting structure because there was like really exciting beginning and really exciting end with both with Mando and in the middle. Completely. Mando was completely absent, completely absent. And it follows Dr. Pershing, who we remember from season one. Yeah. And. The tone, as several people noted, felt very much like Andor. In fact, there were a lot of parallels between Dr. Pershing's story and Cyril's story from Andor. Yes. Um, and I think maybe deliberately so. Maybe. But, um, but and there there's okay, it was slow. Like the middle part was slow, whereas the the beginning and the in the beginning and the yes. end were very fast-paced, action-packed, and then you had this really long slow bit in the middle. But that kind of excited me because what we're getting with Dr. Pershing is finally some hints of the bigger story about Rogu's origin and why this whole cloning thing, which is also coming up in the Bad Batch, by the way. I think that there's a lot about this secret cloning program and the Kaminoans that's going to become part of this sort of the deep mythology behind both the Mandalorian and the Bad Batch. I think there there's a connection there. And I think that we're going to realize why the Mandalorian start the season started halfway through the run of the Bad Batch, because there's something going to be revealed in one of those two shows, which you don't want revealed too soon for the other show. So, I mean, in terms of storytelling, th- there's a there is a bit of a weakness from going from high action to yeah. long, slow to high action. But. I think I'm I'm going to trust that where they're taking us is going to be worth the journey. I, and I, I found like yeah. the stuff about Dr. Pershing was interesting. Like it was an interesting story that they're telling. 
Some people didn't like the fact that it depicted the New Republic as already going off the rails and kind of getting corrupt in some ways. Well, see, I think that the New Republic is born out of the seeds of the Empire and of the Old Republic, and it's human nature. Like, there is no perfect (laughs) utopian system out there. Every new beginning has its roots in what went before it. And a rough start. It, it, read the history of the United States that the first 20 years of the of the United States, it was rough. It was really rough. I mean, it, it was for a while there. Some people figured we were going to just go end up back with the with Britain. Right. I mean, getting rid of Palpatine didn't just by itself fix everything. The, the, the problems that led to the empire to begin with are are still there. Right. They still need and, to be fixed. And the rebellion has been so focused on overthrowing Palpatine and winning the war. They did not have a solid plan for how to govern and like drag the ba- the galaxy back to, to civilization and enlightenment. Right. All in one fell swoop. I mean, I think that it's a very realistic story. I, I think that this is how I would expect it to play out. I find it interesting. Um, that in the, in the books they talk about this and and they now they've done it in the live in this story, they're decommissioning the all of the military. They're getting rid of all of their their ships and their troops and they're decommissioning it all because what is you know what is the, we don't need a peacetime army anymore. We're going back to the way the old republic was, which didn't have an army before the clone army, uh, which is you know. Seems a little bit Pollyanna-ish, which is what the, right. the founding fathers of the United States did. Well, we don't want a standing army. That's just that's just a, a recipe for disaster. And then we ended up needing one. Right. I mean, I, I, I can see it both ways, though, because I do think that a standing army is a recipe for disaster. But so is getting rid of your army. Like, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Right. It's not like there aren't any threats out there. And I think it's all leading up to Thrawn. I think it's, it's leading up to the return of Grand Admiral Thrawn. He's going to be... The one behind the cloning facility in Mando's time. I am I am really curious because having read and loved the new Thrawn books, I really want to know how much of Timothy Zahn's Thrawn books is going to be incorporated into the new live action shows. Right. And I'm hoping a lot. Like, I really hope that where the character of Thrawn goes in the ascendancy books where we really see him as the hero he's a hero he is he is a hero to his people and i want to see that thrawn somehow reconciled with the thrawn that we saw in rebels where he is the The villain the villain i mean he's the grand admiral of the of the empire right so i want i want to find the bridge which lets us get from rebels to the Thrawn books, the Thrawn we know from the books, who is heroic and a fascinating character because I love Thrawn. I really, really love Thrawn. And yeah, yeah, I'm I'm hopeful, but I will be so impressed if they manage to pull that off. It's a hard trick to pull off. Yeah, we'll um, see. We'll see. We'll see. I mean, I will be a little bit disappointed if they bring Thrawn back and he is just the one-sided villain. The one-node villain. Yeah. Speaking of which, there's that new series, The Acolyte, that's come in, too, which is, takes place in the High Republic 100 years before The Phantom Menace. Um, they, they, something leaked, which is said that they're going to be eight episodes, one hour long each. So they're going to that's longer than any like none of the other live action series have been like eight one hour episodes. So they're they're looking to I tell mean, a big story. I I honestly I haven't read anything from the High Republic books and it's not an era which I have been very interested in going back and reading about. Yeah. But the books the first few books were good. After that I got kind of dis- bored of them, frankly. But but I might be more interested in the books if the yeah. show is good. So I might actually this might actually be a case where I 
it, the first few books are worth reading. They are worth reading. But like with a lot of these things, they, they churn them out like these books, like, like, and then the, there's the YA books and then the graphic novels and the comic book, you know, and there's all this media that you're supposed to keep up with. And it's like, I, I can't, I can't keep up with that. I mean, honestly, until, um, until I read a couple of the, uh, well, the Thrawn books. And, and then I read like, a few of the books that had some of the characters I really liked in like new dawn. Um, like, yeah, like the, the hero and Kanan. Um, that was new dawn. That was yeah. new dawn. Right. I, I'm not that interested in getting into the books. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it feels like too much to me. And then I get really annoyed when there's discrepancies in the canon. Like I do not want it all to go back and reread the original Thrawn books where the completely different storyline that's not at all related to the movies. Right. Um, That bothers me. I have a hard time reconciling completely different. Well, Lucas does a good job of keeping them reconciled. So it's yeah. Anyway, so Mandalorian. Good. It's going really well. Bad batch. Good. Going really well. Yeah, I'm I'm liking where Bad Batch is going. I'm liking where Mandalorian is going. Yeah. I think they're both great shows. So, uh, you finished some reading of things, right? I I am yes, I finished some things, and I'm still making steady, slow progress <laughs> on other things. All right, what have you finished? Okay, so I finished a short story called Foster by Claire Keegan. There was has just been released a movie based on this short story and the movie's called the quiet girl and you probably haven't heard of it because it's an irish film and it's like only being released in select markets like the high artsy theaters um but i saw the previews for it and i really wanted to watch the movie because it looks really good and then a friend of mine mentioned that the movie was based on a short story and so not being able to go see the movie right now i went and found the audiobook of the short story and I listened to that. It's a really good story. Uh, it's about a little girl who is from a big Irish family and her family seems to be struggling. Her mom is pregnant and so they send her away to live with some distant relatives for the summer um, just to kind of take some of the burden off of her mom. And it... She feels like she's kind of neglected by her parents, like not horrible neglect, not abusive neglect, but just they're both very busy. Neither of them are particularly affectionate and they're kind of overwhelmed by having too many kids. And then she goes to this couple who it turns out um, had a child who died and they are very warm, very loving, very affectionate, very accepting of her and who she is. And she just blossoms under their care and blooms and she just becomes herself. It's a really sweet story of this relationship between this girl who's hungry for affection and this couple who lost a child and has love to give. Um, Nice. So that was a really good story. I I enjoyed it. It was like, I think the audiobook was an hour long. I guess it was sort of a novella somewhere between a long short story and a short novel. And then I also read The Water Dancer by Ta-Nehisi, sorry, Ta-Nehisi Coates, um, which is his first novel, although he's written some nonfiction books and he's a columnist. I've read, um, I've read some of his essays online and I don't always agree with him, but I think he's a really great writer and I don't remember who recommended the novel to me, but I thought I'd, Go for it. And I, I had put it on hold at the library like months and months and months ago. And it finally came up in my queue. And since there were like a bunch of people waiting for it, I figured I'd just go ahead and read it now. Um, so it's a first person narrative. The protagonist is a slave on a plantation in Virginia at a time when the plantations are starting to to play out because they've over farmed the soil and basically ruined it and so the farms are failing and they're selling off the slaves and their plantation after plantation is going under um and he is the son of the plantation owner and he's very gifted 
he has like a perfect eidetic memory and he's very, very smart. He can remember conversations. He can remember like anything he's seen or heard, basically. Um, except he doesn't remember what happened to his mother, who is gone. Um, but something horrible obviously happened to her and he's buried the memory. Um, and then the plantation owner has one legitimate son who is an idiot and a wastrel and just wants to party and get drunk all the time and has no. And so the father sees the potential in his son, who is a slave, and he basically pulls him into the house and says, you have to take care of your brother. And they're very open about the relationship. Like, you have to take care of your brother. You are your brother's keeper and you have to keep him out of trouble. And eventually I'm going to be gone and you're going to have to be the one who manages the plantation and keeps it, the family legacy intact. But of course, none of it's yours because you're a slave. Okay. And so that's sort of the, the main tension in the novel. And then there's sort of the mystery of what's happened to his mother. And then there's a bit of magical realism in the story in that he seems to have this supernatural ability to transport himself from one place to another. Okay. Like teleportation sort mm -hmm. of thing. Um, but it's connected with, with memory. Like he only does it when he's connected to strong memories and to water. And so it's initially connected to his memories of his mother, which are kind of suppressed, but he, he sort of sees a vision of her and then like jumps. Um, eventually he, he gets caught up in the Underground Railroad and becomes part of their, um, their system for getting people out. But then there's mm -hmm. a lot of tension in terms of among the people who are working on the Underground Railroad, there's not a unity of vision. And so there's a lot of really interesting threads going on. At one point, he goes to Philadelphia for a while and he's free, but then he ends up returning to Virginia and going back to the plantation where he's raised to try to get out the woman he's fallen in love with and the woman who's sort of his adopted mom. Um, and it's, there's a lot of complications. There's a lot dealing with the complicated emotions he feels of like wanting his father's love and approval and yet despising his father, um, wanting to be the the heir and the owner of the, the land and, and having a, a certain sense of family pride and, and love for the place where he's born. Like he loves the land. He loves his home. And yet it's also hell. Right. Um, and I thought that it dealt with all of those emotions in a way that felt thick and real and not like it could very have easily been a sort of, thin novel that was like making a political point and not really telling a story. And I thought that that's not what it was at all. Like it was a really good story. Maybe not the best, like it's not quite up at the level of Toni Morrison, but it was good. And for a first novel, I was, I was quite impressed. Um, so it was worth a read. Um, I really liked it. I, I liked the magical realism elements and uh, Harriet Tubman plays kind of a major uh, secondary role. Mm. Cool. Um, so that was fun. Excellent. Wait, that's the Water Dancer by Tana Ten Hesse Coates. Oh. So uh, let's talk about this week's gospel readings. This is the fourth Sunday of Lent and uh, the Pink Sunday. About Laudete, Laetare, 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 Laetare. Yes, <laughs> I mixed up Gaudete and Laetare. You uh, did. Yes, uh, Laetare Sunday, uh, where the priests wear pink. And the uh, gospel is the man bl uh, blind from birth, who Jesus heals and tells him to go in, wash in the pool of Siloam. And then when the Pharisees find out that Jesus healed him on the Sabbath, they have an aneurysm. And, oh, and then they go to Twitter and they complain about him. And, uh, and this is the one where they question him not once, not twice. But, but three, three times, times and they and they pull in his parents and 
Like, that's this is enough. a long story. That's the that's the extended gospel. Right. We get we got the short we version. We got the short but... version, which I was, I mean, on the one hand, I looked at how long it was, and I thought that's going to be a lot of standing. It is a long gospel. Um, on the other hand, and the short version cut out so much that I just felt like it lost a lot of and, the drama of the story. In you know, it's a long gospel, and Palm Sunday is not that long away. <laughs> that's a long, a lot of standing. I know, I know, it it does lose a lot, but it, there's enough there in the short version even to really give you a real sense of what's going on here, which is, it just baffles me. Well, so there's some interesting, some interesting stuff going on in this. So we could go from the beginning. Um, what you, know, Jesus spits on the ground, makes clay with his saliva, which is, you know, the whole, we, we've talked about that before. That's very visceral. It's very earthy. It's very incarnational. Right. And it, and it calls back to God making Adam in the garden of Eden out of the dust of the ground. Right. Like there's that. Element. And the breath. Right. right. There's that element of Jesus is recalling us back to creation and he's maybe making the man into a new creation. He's he's recapitulating that creative generative act. And obviously when he tells him to go wash in the pool, it it's it's a not just baptism, but also Moses, like we're we're getting a little bit of salvation history here. So the creation with Adam, he goes to to bathe in the pool that you know the people going through the the dead sea, the Red Sea, the Dead Sea. What, Although the of course sea. it also makes me think of Naaman the Syrian, who's well told to, to bathe in the Jordan. There's several people who get this right. treatment. So and in fact, in the different Gospels, right? So so th there is that. Yes, um, and then we get you know now he can see and his neighbors. Isn't this the one who used to sit out there and beg? It, you know, some said it is others. No, it's just someone who looks like him. He says, no, it's he doesn't say, no, it's me. He says, I am, which. That is a very important phrase. I am. He, you know, that is recalls God yet Moses in the, in the burning bush. You know, who, who shall I say sent me? I am sent me. So I am is divine language. And yet it's the beggar saying this. Why? And I think part of it is because there's a the divinization. He, you know, through baptism, we take on some of the life of Christ, the life of God. Like Paul says in Galatians, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. There's a certain amount of where he has, he went to the pool of Siloam, which means sent. And so he has been sent as a sign of God's presence among us. He is, in a sense, God among us by this presence. And we get more of that later on um, where um, in the, in the longer version, we are told that um, I'm trying to think, find it here. There's this whole discourse about how God decide God made you blind from birth be, so that others may believe because of you. Like your, his blindness was a gift from God so that he might be a sign to the world in, through his healing. So he is in a sense is a, is a, uh, a, almost a relic, you know, a devotional or a sign that's been hmm. created. And so, so there's, so there's that. And then they, what is it the Pharisees focus on? They focus on the rules and ignore the reality. The, the, they miss the, the forest for the trees. Right. The, the, he healed on the Sabbath. Yeah, but he healed. He, he healed a man who was congenital, congenitally blind, like not just blind from a disease or an infection of the eyes or something. It was. Yes. Some of the Pharisees go, well, how could a sinful man do such a thing? Right. I mean, it, could, it can't be all bad then. But the, 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 the it seems the majority persist like, no, no, like, I don't care if, you know, God, God's not going to heal someone on the Sabbath because that breaks the rule. Like you're you're confining God, you're defining God based upon your narrow vision, which is the thing that has happens today in our church is people who want to limit God to the things that they imagine are the rules, you know, and no, God can go beyond the rules. They're his rules. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, so they 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 have that fight and then i like that this in the in the longer version they ask um whose sin was it the the disciples ask 
Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? The assumption is that blindness must be an, must be because of personal sin. Also, how could his sin cause him to be born blind? Like, well, it's pre pre sin, right? Right, like like God is going to punish him by being born blind because he is going to sin in his life. Like, does that God is that how God works? God, right? God knows what you're going to do, so He punishes you preemptively. There, but this is the sort of thing that people think about. Like, people still do this. I mean, it's not just a. This is sort of the health and wealth gospel. Oh, if he's sick, he must not be right with God. I mean, there's a little bit of that. Or if I get right with God, I'm going to be well. I'm going to be healthy, and I'm going to have money. Um, and but God says neither. I mean, Jesus says neither he nor his parents sinned. It is so that the works of God might be made visible to him. That's what I was talking about before. And so the the Pharisees have pull, like you said, pull him in three times to, to question him. And and it's like they they they're not looking for the truth. They want him to tell them what they want to hear. And, uh, you know, they pull in his parents. <laughs> They're like, he's an adult. Ask him. I don't know. What, what are you asking me for? And, and you know, so. This, the, the, they're not interested in the truth. They're interested in having their preconceived notions about Jesus confirmed so that they can condemn him, really. I mean, that's what it comes down to. They And, and so it's not truth that they're looking for. And, you know, they say. um, how can a sinful man do such signs? And there was division among them. So they said to the blind man again, what do you have to say about him since he opened your eyes? Oh, I think he's a prophet. How you're born in sin. How dare you try to teach us? Like <laughs> you asked the question. I'm just answering your question. Right. How dare you try to teach us? Well, you're the one who asked me the question. What did you like? What do you want me to tell you? You know, what do you want from me here? Right. And so they threw him out of the synagogue. And so he went and found Jesus and your know, Jesus went and found him. I like that. Jesus heard. So he went to find him. Like, do you believe in the son of man? And the guy doesn't like the guy doesn't catch on real quick. Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus doesn't say I am here. Notice that. He says, you have seen him and the one speaking with you is he. It's a very roundabout way of talking. It is. Well, also, it emphasizes again seeing, doesn't it? You yes. have seen him. So Jesus didn't just open his literal eyes. He also opened the eyes of his heart so that he could perceive, perceive Jesus. who Jesus truly is. Right. So he sees him on two levels. You've seen him because now you can see, but also know me, see me, look right. at me and know who I am. And the one who is speaking with you is he. You hear me. You know, you, so you perceive me through all your senses. I've touched your eyes. You see me with your eyes. You hear me with your ears. But but also recognize my voice. I'm the one who was talking to you before you could see. Right, right. That's true. He <laughs> said before. Right. That's that's actually a good point. I'm the one who helped you before. You that's that's actually on the on that level on the literal level. He didn't see. He didn't recognize Jesus because he wouldn't have seen his face before. That's true. So. Um, so father, we had Father Pinto as our uh, celebrant today. Father Pinto comes from the um, uh, Family Prayer Center, uh, right. from the Holy, the Holy Cross Fathers. And um, he started off by telling a story. I don't know why. <laughs> I'm not sure what it had to do with anything. About this, this girl who went to the livestock auction and bought a calf named Bucket and brought it home. And it befriended their family, St. Bernard, Carlton, and they became fast friends. I think what he was trying to say was, this is marvelous and wonderful. And the, he transitioned from that to talking about the wonders of creation, like how marvelous God's world is. Yep. Look at the marvels that we see every day. And... We don't necessarily, but but I think what he was trying to say is that um, we see marvels every day, but how often do we trace those marvels back to the God who made everything? Right. Like that we, we see these stories and it's just, it's a nice story, but does it lead us to contemplate 
The wonder of God. The wonder of God. Yes. Like that our eyes aren't always open to seeing God at work in the world. And then there was another layer where he talked about we have the opportunity to, to share in God's creativity. Right. I really liked that. I mean, as. Well, you, of course you would, because he told us to go home and write poems. Right. Exactly. <laughs> as somebody who is actively creative, to be told, like. You are a co-creator with God. But he said not only in terms of like those of us who are artists, yep. but also parents. Like we are as we parents are, are given an opportunity to co-create with God. And Our children yes. are. When, when we make children, we are co-creating with God. Right. And so it was also sort of go home and take care of your family and, and wonder. <laughs> make babies. <laughs> well, and also see, see God's hand at work. Yeah. Like here is, here is the wonderful things God does. And I, I felt like there was a hint of that first reading where um, Samuel is sent to go anoint the new king of Israel. Yep. Um, and he sees all of Jesse's big, fine, tall, strong sons. And God says, nope, none of these. And finally, here comes David, the youngest and the smallest. And God says, yep, that one. You know, I just wondered what happened to David's brothers when he became king? Right. Where'd, where'd they go? Did they stay on the family farm, you know, tending the, the flock? Or did he make them generals? Or like the, the Bible doesn't say anything about... David's no. brothers. I mean, it's interesting because we see like Joseph's brothers and how jealous they are of his meteoric rise to right. power. And, and we see Saul and Jonathan and, you know, Uriah and all that sort of stuff. But David's brothers just disappear. Don't make it. Um, yeah. It's curious. I don't know if there's any traditions about it. I should ask Jimmy if, if there are. But one of the things the father said was, is like he talked about, take, you know, when he talked about appreciating creativity, like, Remember, you know, before Hamlet could exist, God had to make Shakespeare. You know, Sh Shamlet wrote Shamlet. Shakespeare. <laughs> Sham oh, it's a wee bit of a uh, little little Hamlet, you know, the Shamlet. No, um, Shakespeare wrote Hamlet, but God made Shakespeare. God made Mozart too. He said. Yes, he also talked about Mozart. Um, and, and what he say? He said it was very po poetic. Awake, O sleeper, to take part in the creativity of God. All creativity, books, shows, movies exist because God gives us a share in his creativity. And that actually struck home for me because that's precisely what StarQuest is about. All of these things, books and shows and movies, even though they're not explicitly about God or about faith. Right. Even if they're by secular people who aren't. Who don't have any faith at all. They are all created by God. And they're all therefore all have a share in that creativity that God gives us as human beings. And so there's always a spark. There's that spark of life in all art. Right. Because all art is all artists are given their creativity from God, even if they don't recognize him as the giver. We, and that's why we, what we're called Star, Star Quest is we are on a quest for the star that will lead us back to Christ, lead us back to Christ. And so we are looking, come, traveling from pagan lands, Hollywood, New York, <laughs> to find the, the, the star, to follow the star back to, the, to the, the source. And that's what we're doing. We're looking for all that is true and good and beautiful in everything, in Star Wars and in books like The Water Dancer and The Last of Us. And, you know, there's, we're looking for that spark of God and that creativity in there. So I really did appreciate that in, in the homily. So it was really good. It was. And uh, he gives his time to go home and make poems and art and other creative things. So I'm making a podcast. There you go. <laughs> All right. And I'm done making a podcast. Let's wrap it up there. We would like to, before we go, take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create Raising the Best, including Daphne M., Amanda M., Nicole, Chris P., and David W. Their generous tax-deductible donations at sqpn.com slash give. Make it possible for us to continue raising the bets and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. And that's it for this time. Find links from our discussion in our show notes at sqpn.com slash bets. That's B-E-T-T-S. 
send your feedback at the StarQuest Facebook page, facebook.com slash StarQuestMedia. Send us an email at bets at sqpn.com or visit the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash Discord. Follow Raising the Bets in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, your favorite podcast app, or at the StarQuest YouTube channel, where you should also make sure to hit the bell to get notifications. Until next time, I'm Dom Bettinelli. And I'm Melanie Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Raising the Bets on StarQuest. Here's another show on the StarQuest network you're sure to enjoy, The Secrets of Middle-Earth. Find it wherever you can find podcasts or at sqpn.com slash Middle-Earth.